Well, let's begin our chapter review here on section 10.1, and that was on tangents. We're just touching on highlights of each section. You need to look at everything in depth. But this is a tangent right here. Line touching the circle in exactly one spot, and it's perpendicular to the radius at that spot. That's theorem 10.1. Now, 10.2 says, suppose I've got two tangents right here, or two lines that are tangent, and they intersect outside of the circle, which they do in most cases, then trim those like this, and these two segments have to be congruent. It's pretty neat, and we've proven it this way. If you draw that in, you, those two congruent triangles just jump right out at you. Now let's look at some examples. Well, here are three types of exercises you might expect to see on the test, again from section 10.1. In the first case, uh, common internal tangent. Maybe we were solving for the length of this segment. So trim that common tangent like this, and remember we could draw the figure like that. Hmm, interesting. Similar triangles? I see that. How about down here? Common external tangent. Let's solve for, well, just the segment there. And again, if you recall, we constructed this figure. Oh, yeah. You remember that one. Um, and finally, in this situation where this is a um, tangent segment, and I could solve for the radius. And if you recall, we did something like this. We said, hmm, hypotenuse is r plus 6, and using the Pythagorean theorem. Now the big ideas from section 10.2, it was an easy one. Just the idea of minor and major arc. That was the big one. Remember, it's um, by default. We see the two letters, it's the minor arc. Take the shortest path, and here in blue is the major. We also had arc addition, which is a lot like segment addition, angle addition, all the way back in section or chapter two. So that's very familiar. And finally, congruent um, circles and arcs. These, If these two circles are not congruent, even if the arc angle is congruent, the arcs are not congruent because they're not the same size circle. That was it. Easy concepts for this section. Let's move on to third. Now, in this section, section 10.3, we have four theorems. I'm going to group 10.3 and 10.6 together here. They look, well, pretty similar. Here I've got two congruent arcs corresponding to two congruent chords, and vice versa. Pretty straightforward there. And on 10.6, I've got the same thing, but I'm adding to it I know these two chords are congruent because they're equidistant from the center of the circle. That is, these two segments are the same. Interesting. Also, since the distance by definition from the center to the chord is to the middle, that bisects those chords. So draw these triangles. A lot of interesting relationships there. Well, also in 10.3 are theorems 10.4 and 10.5. Both relating to this idea that the perpendicular bisector of any chord is a diameter. So right here, this random chord TR, SQ is the diameter. Well now things pick up steam here in section 10.4. We're going to start with the concept of an intercepted arc. Here, this angle intercepts this red arc, the central angle equal in measure to the intercepted arc. But if I were to stretch this and move it out here all the way onto the circumference, that's of course called an inscribed angle. And the inscribed angle is going to be exactly half the arc. That's a big concept. We really need to know that one. And as well, you can see, hmm, if I've got another inscribed angle, since it intercepts the same arc, these two must be congruent. So there you go, that's theorems 10.7, 10.8. Let's move on. Well, theorem 10.9 makes a lot of sense. Easiest way to understand it, any right triangle, well, it must be inscribed in a semicircle. Why? Because 90 degrees intercepts 180. It's as simple as that. And that means that the hypotenuse is the diameter. And we close section 4 with the idea of a cyclic quadrilateral. That is, these quadrilaterals that can be inscribed in a circle. It's an interesting property. 
and we demonstrated this way. Look at this, the, let's say, F intercepts this red arc, and down here, D, the blue angle, intercepts, well, the blue arc. Red and blue arc are 360, so the red and blue angle must add up to 180. They must be supplementary. Same argument for E and G. So we knew that. But the neat thing is, what kind of quadrilaterals must always be inscribed in a circle? And we demonstrated, of course, that well, rectangle is one. There are others. You need to look those up, section 10.4, which ones are sometimes, always, and never inscribed in a circle. This section, 10.5, is all about arcs and angles. Now look at this. We've got a tangent passing through A, and we've got a chord here splitting the circle in two. Now wait a minute. The red and the blue arc must add up to 360, but these two angles are a linear pair. So it just makes sense that there's a 2 to 1 ratio, or another way of saying it, this arc is twice the measure of this angle. And conversely, I could say the angle is half the measure of the arc. Well, the next angle-arc relationship in 10.5 is called the chord-chord angle theorem. I see right here I've got two chords that cross. I've got a pair of vertical angles. Those brown angles are congruent. Right now, the arcs might be, but now they're not. So, I look at this. Well, they're intercepting two different arcs, but these two brown angles have to be equal, so they share the degrees. Remember, the angle is on the inside. It's on the inside of the circle, so that angle is the average. Red plus blue divided by 2. Now let's suppose I have a pair of secants that meet outside the circle here at A. Well, they're going to intercept the circle in the blue arc and the red arc. And quite interesting, the measure of this angle here, angle at A, the green angle, is red minus blue divided by 2. So that would be the secant-secant angle theorem. And again, this is all about angle measures. We'll get to segment lengths in the next section. So um, let's change it. How about change it to one tangent, one secant? Well, the same thing. I'm still intercepting one, two arcs. So red arc minus blue arc, their measures, divide by two again equals the green angle. Well, finally, we I got one other case. How about tangent, tangent? In this case, again, all three of these cases have something in common. The angle is on the outside. It's exterior of the circle. And in those cases where the angle is on the outside, it's going to be red minus blue divided by 2 equals the measure of this angle. But this one has a little special bonus. Tangent, tangent. We proved this in class, but you should know this. Um, in this case, the red arc and the blue arc, well, they always add up to 360. And then we could simplify this, and as we did before, it's going to simplify to this. The measure of this blue arc and the measure of this angle, this green angle, always, always, always add up to 180. That's going to be handy. Now, in section 10.6, unlike 10.5, we're not looking at angle measures. We're looking at lengths of segments. Remember, we call these the power theorems. Uh, your text doesn't, but we do. So remember, the two chords, well, the two chords, if they cross each other, they're going to split each other into two pieces. Red times blue equals orange times green. Well, here we have two secants intersecting at E, and the secant secant power theorem says this exterior segment times the entire secant segment equals the orange times the green. And the tricky part here is you're not always given this and this. So it might be red times parentheses red plus chord is equal to orange times parentheses orange plus gray. In our final power theorem, we have a tangent secant. Remember, a tangent just touches the circle in one spot. And this is going to make it a little bit, well, I think more simple. Because it'll be the green section squared is equal to the 
exterior part in red times the entire secant segment blue, or green squared equals parentheses red times red plus gray. Either way. And finally, in section 7, we were considering well, graphing circles on the coordinate plane. We'll just go through one example. Um, you've got your center right here in green, containing this point over here in red. You remember we, well, we could find that radius using Pythagorean theorem, or in this case, a triple or distance formula, either way. And I take a point on that circle, so I know where the circle is. It's over there. And then I want an equation for that. So there's my equation. Make the substitution, simplify, and we're done.